It's not news to anyone that we have got a massive plastic pollution problem. Microplastics have been found in every corner of the world, even in our bloodstream. Only 9% of the plastic that we make ever actually gets recycled. The rest of it just gets burned or discarded. So surely there's a better way to get rid of plastic without completely destroying the environment. Dr. Federica Bertaccini is a molecular biologist researching new ways to break down plastic waste. Will you start off by telling me how you discovered that the worms broke down plastic? The discovery was accidental because I'm a beekeeper and uh, these worms happen to be a plague for the beehives. So what happens is that uh, uh, if you have a beehive, during the winter, some of those without bees, you put in a storage room. And then in February, March, in the spring, uh, you put them back in the field. So one time, several years ago, it was in March, I went to get my box back with all the honeycomb there from my storage room, and it was plagued with these worms. These worms are really caterpillars or larvae of the wax moth Galleria melanella. As caterpillars, they live as parasites in bee colonies, disrupting the hive by chewing through the beeswax secreted by bees to make their honeycombs. So I wanted to clean it and I start putting this worm in the plastic bags. And then I forgot them, and after a while I went back and I saw the plastic bag was full with holes. So the idea was, okay, this hole, uh, let's check chemically uh, the plastic around the hole. And we found out the plastic was not uh, simply munched, uh, but was uh, chemically modified, it was oxidized. That was the beginning of the story. Okay, so this is where the magic happens. Yes, so this is the incubator where we keep the worms. Uh, temperature is warm, 28 degrees. Nice and toasty for them. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Here they are. Several boxes in here. This is one of those. Here they are. Okay, here here they we are. go. Here they are. Producing their cocoon here. And these filaments constantly. And then you can see some more here. So there it's a squeamish are. look away now. <laughs> Can I hold one? Sure, yes. Is there a tiny one? Wow. So what is it that they're eating here? I'm feeding them with the uh, honeycombs, uh, straight from an uh, apiary. So they eat uh, whatever is in there. Wax, pollen, propolis, bee larvae, probably as well. And they, you know, they quite, uh, eat quite a lot. After a week or, or a few days, they, that's, that's how honeycomb becomes. So these are known as plastic-eating worms, but they don't actually eat the plastic, right? No, they actually don't. Uh, in the field, some of these worms are called plastivores, but it's, uh, I think it's a misconception. They degrade plastic like polyethylene, but they cannot feed on those. They, they die on a diet uh, based only on polyethylene. Probably not healthy for anyone to be eating plastic. I don't think so. <laughs> not even for the worms, yeah. <laughs> So what's the science of what actually goes on when the worms are breaking down the plastic? What we discovered is they can oxidate plastic, meaning introducing in some way, still we don't know how, molecule of oxygen. So when we think about degradation of uh, a plastic like polyolefin, like polyethylene, for example, degradation in the environment, there is a, 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 a reaction that, that it takes quite a long time. This is what we all know. So this worm can do that in a few, within a few hours from exposure. Some plastics like PET, which is used to make plastic bottles like the one I threw away earlier, are easy to recycle. But others like polyolefins, which can be found in countless things like straws, food packaging, and even carpets, are much harder to degrade. And plastics don't ever fully decompose. They just get broken down into smaller and smaller particles by natural processes. This happens because of oxidation, the chemical reaction that takes place when a substance comes into contact with oxygen in the presence of heat or light. The reaction breaks down the chemical bonds in the hydrocarbon chains through a process called chain scission, resulting in the formation of smaller chain fragments. In nature, this can take anything from 20 to 500 years. 
but scientists have found that enzymes in the waxworm saliva can speed up the oxidation of polyethylene to a matter of hours. When they make their own cocoon, uh, the fresh one, attached to plastics, when they, they, they do it sometimes attached to a plastic bag, uh, the plastic bag gets broken in, and the breeze forms. So we said, okay, there's something coming out of the mouth, and maybe it's attached to the cocoon or not. So we, we decided to investigate that and then uh, collecting the saliva. And saliva, in the strict sense, is the juice produced by the salivary glands. So the magic ingredient is the saliva? So we found out the saliva, in fact, is the magic ingredient. So from the mouth, uh, we uh, uh, recovered the saliva, applied on plastic, on polyethylene, and we found out oxidation again. So we know that um, this enzyme is capable of oxidizing polyethylene, but there are a lot. If you take a sample of the saliva, there are so many, it's just very condensed. So maybe these, as a, as a first difference compared to other lepidotes that we tried, is the first step. So there are a lot of these proteins. While if you observe saliva from other lepidopters, we don't see that. Enzymes are proteins that speed up chemical reactions. In fact, almost all metabolic processes in cells need enzymes to make them happen fast enough to sustain life. So how do you get the saliva out of these worms? Well, you with the mouth pipette and the capillary, and uh, it's relatively easy because it's just, uh, we just put the needle in the mouth, but without digging, just uh, the saliva comes out, um, which is a relatively white liquid. And then we applied lab techniques to analyze the saliva, what kind of proteins are there. And how do you scale this up? Because presumably you're only getting a tiny bit of saliva. Well, the idea is to reproduce, to produce the enzymes, the proteins, in the laboratory. Now there are techniques to reproduce in large scale. Uh, and that's what we are supposed to do now. Um, production of enzymes in large scale, and then uh, try to increase the efficiency, stability, all these details which are uh, connected to the study of a protein. Do we need uh, to produce enzymes in a certain amount to, to be able to see uh, how much we will need to degrade a certain amount of plastics, because this is key for, uh, for uh, being able to apply this. Polyethylene is a very specific plastic, isn't it? How much of our plastic trash does that make up? It's about 30%, uh, which is a lot. Is, this is one of the polyolefin, one of the most used, and in fact, what, the most produced. And then we have polystyrene, we have polypropylene. These are all uh, polyolefins. So together, we're talking about between 50 and 70% of uh, global plastic production. So these worms, uh, uh, has been shown by other labs, that they can degrade polystyrene. Polystyrene, polyethylene. Now we are checking polypropylene. Let's see if it works. And then uh, the idea, because the target clearly will be not only the polyethylene, but the mixed plastic. This is the, the most difficult thing. Dr. Wei-Min Wu is a former senior research engineer at Stanford University. Together with his colleagues at Beihang University, China, he's also been working on plastic pollution and biodegradation for years. His most recent research focuses on yellow mealworms, the larvae of the darkling beetle. We studied uh, at least five different worms. The worms, they belong to so-called uh, a family of a darkling beetle. The darkling beetle contains 2,000 members, but right now we only study, okay, a few of them. We found the yellow mealworm. Yellow mealworm is the best one. Also other worm, like a silver worm, dark mealworm, they also degrade the plastic. But mealworm is very popular, popular. And how do they actually break down the polystyrene? Uh, first, uh, the worm, they chop and they eat the plastic. And then they bite it and then make the plastic particle become smaller. And then this smaller particle get into their gut. And then they squeeze the digestive fruits, uh, fruits it contain uh, for example, many enzymes and uh, also some emulsified uh, chemicals, organic chemicals, they digest food. And uh, in their gut, they contain a lot of gut bacteria and other microorganisms. This microorganism 
and their digest fluids working together, work together and digest uh, the plastic. Can mealworms survive on a diet of styrofoam? They can survive for at least four weeks, sometimes six weeks, even longer. Because they can digest the plastic, they generate energy, you know, from the digestion and they get a carbon source. Unfortunately, this plastic done produce then provide the nutrients, especially mineral nutrients. So they could not support mere own groups. Just like a human being, we only eat rice and then we can survive, but we get sick. And how fast can they break down the plastic? How long does it take? Oh, it's very fast. Um, they eat the plastic, the plastic into their get into their digestive system. It uh, take uh, about 12 to, I think 15 hours. And then discharge is uh, ficana or pufu, okay. We are on pufu. And during this period, at least 50% plastic are digested. What are your hopes for the future of this research? Oh, the future research, I think this is a wonderful discovery. This gave uh, uh, us some idea. There could be some way, okay, to solve for the, pla okay, the plastic pollution issues. Um, it could, okay, eventually we understand, okay, what happened, how this system works. We could develop biotechnology for, you know, plastic degradation and recover you know, valuable chemicals from the waste plastic. Plastics are designed to be nearly indestructible. Only 9% is currently recycled. 60% of plastic waste is incinerated or goes into landfill and a further 30% leaks out into our environment, where it will pollute natural ecosystems for hundreds of years. If we think about uh, um, the plastic waste management to date, uh, we don't have many solutions. And uh, we have recycling, we have incineration, and then landfill sites uh, accumulation, and then so leak into the environment. And biotechnology could be one of the solutions for plastic waste management. There are no technologies so far because they have not been developed yet, but this could be one of these. It could be the first, actually. And so if we manage to arrive at the point where you can apply uh, liters of the solution of enzymes to piles of plastic, maybe they will be the way uh, to tackle this problem.